Thank you for joining us today for this life-changing message from River of Life. If you are ever in our area, we would love for you to join us. For more information, click the link below or download our app in the App Store under ROL Crawfordville. Now, let's join guest speaker Bill Jenkins as he teaches from the Word of God. I was preaching in a church not too long ago with one of these things, and I, I asked the congregation, I said, is this on? Am I, I said, am I on? And a big guy in the back says, we'll know in about five minutes. <laughs> so uh, Linda and I are thrilled to death to be back. I have all the places we go and preach. I love preaching at the River of Life. And the reason for that is the Spirit of God that's here. Do not take this for granted. It is not in every church. Amen. We do want to praise God. We had four adults saved last Sunday over in Geneva, Alabama, and you were a part of that. You, you support this ministry, and so you're a part of that. Thank you for that. Uh, real quick word. Uh, an old saying says that if you've got a, chicken, a rooster and he won't crow in his own hen house, you need to take him and make chicken and dumplings out of him. So... Uh, uh, do a little crowing here in my own hen house. Uh, we have a daily devotion. Many of you are aware of that. It's uh, 10 minutes every day, Monday through Friday. You can find it at Bill Jenkins or uh, His Grace Ministry. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, and Instagram. And so please do that. Also, immediately following this service this morning, over in the administration building, Linda and I are going on a journey next Labor Day. We're going on a uh, Paul's Missionary Journey cruise. Uh, that means we get on a boat and get to eat all the time. No, we, 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 we are going to go, and we're going to see places like Ephesus. We're going to Corinth. Uh, we're going to see uh, uh, just so many different places. Please, if you are even the remotely interested in, in maybe going on that cruise with us, join us as soon as this service is over over in the administration building. You got your Bible today? Go ahead and turn them on. And find, if you will, please, Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. I am so sorry that I will not be here next Sunday. I will be over in Crespi, Florida, preaching over there. And you know, you know that on baptismal Sunday, Lake Sunday, that I get out there with those kids and, and I ride those, uh, those, what do you call those floats, and I get out there and barefoot ski. And, but since I'm not going to be here, I'm just going to let Brother Henry take my place in all of those, okay? <laughs> Go after him, Brother Henry. Show them we're still young. You got your Bible? The Word of God says, and it begins actually uh, a little bit ahead of us, in Luke chapter number 10, and I'm actually going to begin reading in verse 25. The Bible says, and behold, that means to stop and think about this, look at it. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up tempting him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right, do this and thou shalt live. But, <laughs> that's the way we always are when the Lord tells us something, we want to butt against it like an old billy goat. But he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Verse number 30, Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment. They wounded him. They departed, leaving him half dead. By chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan... As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion upon him. He went to him. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He set him on his own beast, and he brought him to the inn and took care of him. Verse 35 is a key verse. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. Say host. That's a very, very important word for this morning. He gave them to the host and said unto him, 
take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. You'll pray with us, please. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this church. Thank you, Lord God, for the spirit that abides here. Lord God, I need you to build up that fire within me. I come before you, Lord God, needy this morning. I need you to sweep through my life, Lord God, like never before. God, I want you to be empowered by you because anything that I do will only be a flop. But God, if you show up this morning, if you would be so kind and merciful and full of grace that you would speak to the heart of people. God, we're going to see people saved today. We'll see lives changed for all eternity. And Father, it'll all be for your honor for your glory, and for your praise, and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very familiar parable that's before us this morning, given by our Lord Jesus Christ in answer to the question, well, who is my neighbor? And he drew a very vivid picture, which has been told now for 1,800 years. I don't know of anything in the Word of God that brings out more truthfully the wonderful power of the gospel than this particular story, which we've heard and we've read this morning. The story is of a man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, and the thieves had come out and they fell upon him, and they had taken all of his money, they stripped off all of his clothes, they didn't even kill him, they left him for dead so that the vultures and the desert animals could come and finish the job that they started. As you began to look at this parable, I want to point out to you this morning that there are three main characters. The first one I would point to you is that of a traveler. The Bible says about this man that this is a a, a man that uh, was traveling from Jerusalem. There was a day when he was dwelling in peace. There was a day when he was in the city of God and and, and things were wonderful. And it so aligns with what happens to us in our lives. When you and I are born onto this earth, we are born with a sin curse of our parents. But there are days that we refer to as days of innocency. It is during those days that if a child dies, that child immediately goes to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Jesus Christ doing the speaking, suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. And we know that those children go to be with him. But as that child grows, and as he continues in life, there comes times when he must make decisions. And there comes that day when the Holy Spirit of God begins to deal with his heart about being saved. Blessed is the child that answers when first called. Unfortunately, that's not the case for most of us. I picture in my own mind this man as he's there in Jerusalem, and he's made a decision. He's heard about something down at Jericho. By the way, Jerusalem, the city of God, Jericho, pictured in your Bible as the city of sin. It's the city that was destroyed when when Joshua and Israel came across the Jordan River. It was the first judgment of God in the promised land. Here, he's decided that he's going to go down to Jericho. Now, now people are telling him, you don't need to go down there. Jericho is, is, is all right in and of itself, but the trip to it is filled with danger, and, and there, there's thieves everywhere. There's murderers. And you can almost hear his friends saying, look, you really don't need to go that way. You really don't need it. Maybe it was his wife. Maybe she said, hon, we'll get along fine without it. Maybe, maybe it was his children. They're saying, Daddy, look, you don't need to make this trip. But you know how we are. When we decide something, the heart of man is fully set in him, and so he goes. And at first, the trip seems to be all right. In fact, uh, he's kind of chuckling to himself. They were such foolish people to tell me not to make this trip. I'm having such a wonderful time. I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to have such great riches when I get to Jericho. I'm going. And then all of a sudden, the thieves were there. 
And the word of God paints for us a very vivid picture of what the thieves do. John chapter 10 and verse number 10, the Bible says, The thief cometh not but to kill, excuse me, to, to steal and to kill and to destroy. This man has fallen. All that he had is now gone. I want to share with you that there is a progression in the life of anyone who rejects the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. It begins with a very clear call. It begins when God, the Holy Ghost, comes into your life and he begins to tell you that you are in need of a Savior. John chapter 16, the Bible says, Jesus Christ doing the speaking, it's expedient that I go away, for if I go not away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But when he is coming to you, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. That's his job, and he's very faithful in this job. In fact, Titus 2.11 says, The grace of God hath appeared unto all men. Every person sitting in this building this morning, Every person driving up and down the highway out there this morning, every person living in Wakulla County this morning is loved by an almighty God. And God loves them to the point that he sent his Holy Spirit to come and to convict them of sin that all might be saved. Your Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. He's not willing for any to perish, but that all should come into repentance. And yet man, man says some other time. Man says when I get older, when I have a little bit more fun. I had one man actually tell me recently, preacher, when I get as old as you are, then I'll get saved. The problem with that is Hebrews 9, 27. The Bible says there's appointed unto man a time to die. Then comes the judgment. You don't know when that's going to be. I don't know when that's going to be. And yet when you try to warn people, get off of that road. Don't listen to the devil. Don't listen to the world. Don't listen to the, the flesh as it tries to trick you and beguile you and lead you to the snare of the devil. Don't listen. Yet they continue to go. And that road from Jerusalem to Jericho is a very demanding road. It is a departing road for he left his home. It's a devilish road because there is where the robbers live. It's a very discouraging road. It's a defiling road. It's a despairing road. It is a defeated road. It is a road that will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it always costs you more than what you want to pay. Just in passing by, the Levite and the priest saw the man laying there, but what did they have that could help a man in that condition? And the answer is absolutely nothing. And they kept right on going. If the traveler that is before us is a picture, uh, 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 an illustration, if you will, of the misery of a sinner who decides not to heed the call of God, but to go his own way, then certainly the Good Samaritan illustrates the mercy of the Savior. Notice what he says in this passage of Scripture, beginning in verse number 33. He says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came. Aren't you glad today he came to you? I love the old song that says, when I could not go to where he was. He came to me. I, differ, I don't know if you remember it or not, dear friend, but I remember quite well the day that he knocked on my door. And I was thrilled with the mercy and grace that he presented. Here is a picture, if you will, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw him. Notice, if you will, there in verse number 33. The Bible says a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, that word saw there is much more than just to look at somebody. You and I might have walked over and said, my, my, what a tragedy. Look at all this. No, no, no. The word that's used here, according to vines, is a little Greek word that means to see in a perfect tense with a present meaning, signifying primarily to have seen or perceived, hence to know or to have knowledge of, whether absolutely or, in, or as in divine knowledge. When the Samaritan came to where the traveler was and he looked at him, he was not only looking on the outside, he was looking on the inside. 
John chapter 2, verse 25, the word of God says, He needeth not, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, He needeth not that any would testify of man, because He knows what's in man. Have any of y'all ever fooled your wives? We're going to have an altar call in a moment. <laughs> Turn it around, preacher. Have any of y'all women ever fooled your husband? Have any young has ever fooled your parents? I love Life 360, don't you? <laughs> my, my daughter, had, she spent, we, we were together this week, and uh, last night we have a, a, one of our granddaughters is a senior in high school. And so my daughter and her husband and, and uh, her oldest, my oldest granddaughter were at my house. And my daughter looked at 360. It was 10 o'clock. And she saw where her other daughter was and her sent this text, you better be on your way home. <laughs> Isn't that great? But there's one person you're never going to fool. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes to us, he sees us as we are. Over in the Old Testament, book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, this is what the Bible said about God's encounter with you. The Bible says, None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion on thee, but thou wast cast out into the field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee, I saw thee polluted in thine own blood. I said unto thee when I, thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee when thou was in thy blood, live. You see, when the Samaritan came to where the traveler was, he saw him. But no, the Bible goes further in verse number 35, verse number 33. He says that not only did he see him, but he had compassion upon him. He began to love him. Well, he just met him. Oh, no, dear friend, he had been loving him since the beginning of the eons. In fact, what you find in your Bible, Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, that God set his love on you hmm, while you were yet a sinner. He sent his son Jesus to die for you before the ages were ever created. If you'll ever get a hold of this, it'll, just, it'll, it'll blow your mind. That God who is sovereign and knows all things could love every one of us. So much so that before the foundations of the earth were ever laid, before Adam and Eve ever walked in the garden, before man ever sinned, God had already laid aside a propitiation, a payment for that man's sin, his own son, Jesus Christ. That's the reason that John would write John 3 and verse number 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He had compassion on him. And then the Bible says that he went to him, verse number 34. Now understand that he's nasty, he's dirty, he's naked, he's half dead. And yet the Word of God says that the Samaritan went to him. And then he began to bind up his wounds. You've got your Bible there in front of you. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him up on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. There are people that speculate that this traveler is probably a doctor because a doctor would be carrying bandages to bind up a, a wounded man. There are, there are others that speculate, well, maybe he was a shepherd because he had the oil, and the shepherds would carry the oil to help anoint the sheep. And I, 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 I love their speculation, but I don't believe either one of those is correct. I believe this man, when he came to where he was and saw the great need in this man's life, that he began to take of his own personal possessions and began to meet those needs in that traveler's life. Can't you see him tearing the bottom of his robe off as he begins to bind up those bro broken bones and those bruises? Can't you see him as he's pouring in oil and joy? And one commentator said that those were just symbols of the Holy Spirit of God. And then the Bible says that he put him on his beast. I like that, amen? The man couldn't walk. He's half dead. And so the, the Bible says that the, the Samaritan picked him up and he set him on his beast. You know what your Bible says? Isaiah chapter 46, verse number 4. I love this. It says, even to your old age, I am he. Even to the hoary hairs, 
will I carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. I'm glad today I'm not walking on my own strength. Hey, some of y'all didn't get that. I said, I'm glad today I'm not walking in my own strength. Because if you and I try to do it, we're going to fail miserably. That's the reason the Bible says, cast all your care upon him, 1 Peter 5, 7, because he cares for you. Can't you see the Samaritan lifting up that broken body, putting it on that donkey, and then he's leading him to the end. And when he gets him to the end, he doesn't just throw him out saying, hey, guy, this is the end of the ride. Give me my 25 cents. I'm on my way. Oh, no. The Bible says that he began to take care of him. He began to watch over him. He began to nurse him. He began to do whatever was needed to get this man back to where he was. I love this. He brought him, the Bible says in verse number uh, 35, excuse me, the last part of verse number 34, and took care of him. He brought him to an end. You know what an end is? I love this. Linda and I get to stay in a lot of motels. An end is a home away from home on your way home. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Get this picture. Hey, wait a minute. You left your home this morning. You came into this home. But, dear friend, this is only an end because we're going home. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. What you find out about an end is that an end is a place where the weary are welcomed. An end is a place where the dirty can get clean. An inn is a place where a stranger is welcomed. An inn is a place where the hungry are fed. An inn is a place that the world has to stay outside. Welcome to the end. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. There is within this parable a third character. I told you there were three. There was the traveler, and there's the good Samaritan, and and that's pretty much all we know about this, but there's a third character. Notice, if you will, in your Bible, the Bible says there in verse number 35, and on the morrow, after he had taken care of him, that when he departed, he took out two pence and he gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. The host it's very important because if this is the end, then all of us who are members in the end now find ourselves as the host. And so what happens is the Holy Spirit leadership and the divine direction of Almighty God Bring somebody that's broken and bruised and, and can't take care of himself. He, he's just about ruined his life on the road to Jericho. He's gone so far from the voice of God that it's just a very, very innocent, sweet, uh, kind whisper now. It's not no longer the convicting power. It is just come, come, come. And they've gone, but they've, they've failed. And so the good Samaritan comes and picks him up, and he brings him. To the end. And you're the host. And listen to what the Bible says. You take care of him. I was thinking in preparation for this message. How many of people have come into this fellowship in the last couple of months? 20 at a time. 30 at a time. 20 at a time. Coming to be saved. Coming into the fellowship. And the command from God the Father for every one of them. You take care of them. Don't let them fall through the cracks. They can't take care of themselves. They don't have that knowledge yet. When they get out of bed, they're going to fall because they've been beat half to death. And they're going to need somebody that's going to come beside them. Somebody, listen, I believe in the Holy Spirit of God, but every once in a while you need a little flesh and blood. Say amen right there. And you need somebody that will lift them up and somebody that will strengthen them and somebody that will give them a little nourishment. And when the bandages need changing, you go ahead and change them. Hey, does that mean he's never going to fall again? Absolutely not. Does that mean he's not going to get dirty again? Absolutely not. Does that mean he's not going to bleed and get all over my clothing uh, again? No. He's going to need continual care. You and I are the host. 
But more than that, more than just the plea, he's got the example. You see, back up in 34, the good Samaritan, the Bible says, he took care of him. And so now the host has an example of what it means to take care of somebody that's wounded. We just have to look at Jesus. We, we, we got to see what Jesus did and follow his example. Well, what did he do, preacher? He went to where the broken were. He didn't put a sign out in front of the, ho the, the hotel saying, hey, look, all you broken folks, come on in here. That's not what the Good Samaritan did. The Good Samaritan went to where the broken was, and he picked him up, and he put him on his feet, and he brought him to the end. You and I need to be going into the highways and hedges and compelling people to come in that the house of God may be full. Do you understand? Matthew 28, Jesus said, go you into all the world baptizing them that would believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and teaching them to observe all things. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you understand in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 that the Bible says that you have been placed into the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, as Christ was in the world, reconciling the world unto himself, he hath committed unto us this same ministry of reconciliation. So who have you got lately? My nephew called me the other day. He said, hey, Papa. I said, what? He said, how's the fish bite? I said, I have no earthly idea. He said, what's the matter? I said, I haven't been fishing since July 4th. Then he made this tremendous statement. Are y'all ready for this? I guess it's hard to catch fish if you don't go fishing. <laughs> Can I help you with something? It's hard to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ if you don't go so winning. You got to go where they're at. You got to help them. You got to put them on that beast. You got to bring them to the end. And then the Bible goes further here. It says, and I'm just going to give you this quickly. The host serves with the authority of the Samaritan. You'll notice what he said. The Samaritan told the host, you take care of him. What's the authority behind this church? I love our pastors, but friend, the authority behind this church is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We have authority in this building. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. Authority over the things of the flesh and over the world and over the things that come against us to destroy us. Not only does the host serve with the authority of the Samaritan, the host serves with the assistance of the Samaritan. The Bible says he took out two pence and gave it to him. He's already meeting future needs. Now, I'll just give you this. I'm a premillennial historical dispensationalist. What does that mean? Probably nothing to you. But he took out two pence. The pence in that day and time was a day's wage. So the Samaritan gave the host enough for two days. And then he says, when I come again. Now, why is that significant? Because the word of God says that one day is with the Lord a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Amen? He's been gone 2,000 years. That's two days. I'm looking for him to come. Amen? You see, the host serves not only with the assistance of the Samaritan, the host serves in the absence of the Samaritan, and the host serves with the expectancy of the return of the Samaritan. You ought to be living every day, walking for Jesus, looking for Jesus. Somebody said, have you found Jesus? Didn't know he was lost, but he's coming. Amen. And then also, here's this. The host serves with the expectancy of a reward from the Samaritan. The Samaritan said, whatever you spend, when I come again, I will repay. Church, I don't know if you know this or not, but it's going to cost us to do the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But hey, whatever you spend, when he comes again, he'll repay. And by the way, he is a very, very good 
bookkeeper. I've been, been, been walking with him for some time now. There, there are verses in the Bible that just thrill me to death. I like this one. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Isn't that good? That's one you can take home and go to bed with tonight. Oh, listen, I love this parable. But I have to quickly go back to that traveler. What happened to him? Well, he was there in the inn, and he was, he was being taken care of. And then, then whatever his needs were, the, the man was, the, the, the host was paying for those needs. And then suddenly the Samaritan came back. And as much as, as the traveler appreciated the host and all he did for him, when he saw the return of the Samaritan, the one that had come to where he was, the one that had had compassion upon him, the one that had, had bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine, the one that had picked him up and, and put him on the beast and, and brought him to the inn and took care. When, when he saw the one that had done all of that for him, don't you feel like there's a little rejoicing going on? Don't you feel like, and I don't know how y'all are, some people are funny, they don't like to be touched, some folks don't even like to shake hands, beating the folks I ever met in my life. <laughs> I want to tell you something, I, I love hug, hugging on folks. Me and mostly, my wife don't like that other thing. <laughs> I don't mind hugging on Brother Henry, don't mind hugging on Chuck and Todd and that bunch. But I want to tell you something, when Jesus comes, don't get in my way. <laughs> if all you're looking for is a handshake, just step to the side. It'd be a lot safer for you. <laughs> oh, no, dear friend. I want to thank him because I was that traveler. I was the one who was broken and bruised and had no hope. In fact, the Word of God paints a very vivid picture of a lost person. It says that we're dead in our trespasses and sin. And by the way, dead people don't earn their way into heaven. Dead people don't get better. Dead people don't turn over a new leaf and come back. Dead people are just dead people. And yet the Word of God says in the book of Ezekiel that when He's passed by us, He's spoken to dead, dry bones. Live. You know, that's what He's offering this morning. For everyone that will receive it, life. Some of you sitting here today, you know what I'm talking about. God spoke to you so many years ago. And you heard that voice clear and plain, but now that voice is but a whisper. Oh, so many things have come into your life. Just like that traveler on the road to Jericho. You've been around the bend. You've seen some things. You've gone up and down. You've met some people you wish you'd never met before. And now your life is in shambles. You put on a good front. Some of you have, have, you, you have succeeded in worldly wealth. But Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I have found in church after church across this country that the people that will come and say, Lord, would you save me? He's never turned one of them down. I've never, I've never met anybody who said, I came to the Lord, and he said no. I'm wondering today if maybe you need to come to the Lord. Our heads are bowed, please. Our eyes are closed. In this moment, as God speaks to your heart, the Holy Spirit of God is doing its office work. I wonder if there'd be anybody here this day who would say, Preacher, I need you to pray for me. I believe you're a man of God, and I believe you'll pray for me. I, I promise you, friend, I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. I, I won't call you out or anything like that. But if you'd say, preacher, would you please pray for me? I'm not sure that I'm saved. I, I mean, I've been baptized. I've joined a church and all of that. I'm trying to do the best I can. But preacher, I'm just really not sure that I'm saved. If you're there like that here this morning, Nobody else is looking around, just me. Preacher, would you just pray for me real quick? Promise you we won't come to you. Nobody will embarrass you. Just raise your hand straight up. Preacher, pray for me all the way in the back, all the way up here on the front. 
over here on this side, three, four, five. There's a couple together. Thank God for that. There's this preacher, pray for me. Anyone else before we pray? Preacher, would you just pray for me so I can get this thing settled? I want to know for sure I'm going to be saved. Anyone else? Father God, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to do a work in the life of every person that raised their hand right now. I'm asking you, Lord God, to minister as only you can. Your word says that, God, if we would believe in our heart that Jesus is the Christ and that if we with our mouth would confess him, that with the mouth confession would be made unto salvation. In fact, you go so far to say that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, there's people here today that have raised their hand because the Holy Spirit has spoke to their heart. And they want to make sure that they're going to be saved. Now, for every one of you that raised your hand, I'm, I'm going to ask you right where you are, right where you're sitting, if God's dealing with you right now, and I believe he is, that you would pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I'm lost. I've got sin in my life that I cannot overcome. But I do know that you love me, that you sent your son to die for me. And Lord Jesus, I ask you right now, save my soul. Help me, Lord God, to trust you, to believe in you. Help me to be saved. Heads are bowed, please, eyes are closed. No one. Thank you again for watching our message from River of Life. If this message has touched you today, or if you need someone to pray with, please contact our office at 850-926-1200 or email us at info at rolcrawfordville.com. We also want to encourage you to visit us Sunday mornings at 1030 or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Please visit us at rolcrawfordville.com for more information and direction.